and commence the meeting. Gracious Father, we thank you for your scepter of mercy. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to gather with your children. Thank you, Lord, for the honor to learn at your feet. Both the speaker and the hearers, we are at your feet, and we are looking unto you to say, Lord, reveal to us the mystery of the kingdom. Give us understanding. Reveal thy glory to us that we might be conformed to your image. Father, let this be a building block to what we are building in our lives today. Let it not be a wasted time of just hearing, not understanding and not doing, but that Lord, it will establish us further in Christ Jesus. Lord, look upon us with eye of mercy, be gracious to us, open for the rivers of life from heaven. Let it flow to every life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so um, the last time we, we were talking about um, walking in wisdom, Colossians chapter 4, verse 5, and we said that the way we relate with people who are not in Christ is quite different, and you must be discerning to know people's level. Otherwise, you will have expectations that you will get disappointed at the end of the day it's not everybody that we gather together that are this at the same level or commitment to jesus so when you lose god um you may run into problem we also learn how our speech ought to be uh particularly if you have problem with anger it's going to be a problem for you all through your life People who have problem with anger. I've seen anger wrecked marriages. I've seen anger wrecked lives. I've seen people lose their job because of anger. There are people in prison today or on death row today because of anger. Uh, so you've got to be careful. The Bible says be angry and sin not. What that means is that people can hurt you. But that does not mean you should go out of your way in that anger. To respond or to take action that's the meaning of be angry and say not it means you can be hot you can be hot but don't speak don't speak out of that anger that if you do that then you are sinning people can hurt you there's nobody that is not being hurt when jesus was on the cross he was being hurt imagine nails piercing his hands and yet he didn't get angry to say, oh, you these stupid people killing me for not doing anything. Okay. And so you must recognize that your mouth. In fact, the Bible says, if God does not have control over your tongue, he doesn't have control over your life. And that's the reality. So it was saying in verse 6, he said, let your speech be always with grace. Ask yourself, do you speak with grace? Sometimes as mother. As a mother, even the way you speak to your children, it is out of anger. You know, you may have issues with your spouse and then you transfer it to your children who did not do anything wrong to you. And then you will beat them for not doing Do you know that is wickedness? Do you know you will account to God for every spanking you are doing out of anger? God did not ask you to raise your children with anger. He didn't say the rod of anger. He says the rod of correction. But many times we beat children out of anger. It's wickedness. In fact, you should be jailed for doing, for doing such. It's just pure wickedness. You must ensure that what comes out of your mouth represents Jesus. No matter how you feel. Let me tell you, there is nobody that is not being pained, that is not being hurt. There is nobody like that. I had an incident over the weekend. It hurt me deeply. What came out of my mouth? I said, we must forgive. That was all I said. I said, we must forgive. But it hurt me deeply. In my natural self, I will love to cut them. I will love to have them jailed. I will love to have them dealt with. But I have not learned that from Jesus. And I also understand that I also need mercy. 
it is many times people don't have understanding of how much they need mercy. That's how, that's why they can't extend mercy to other people. No matter what people have done to you, if you understand your own personal need for mercy, you will overlook it. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The same mercy you are praying for, you can't extend it to other people. They are saying, oh Lord, have mercy on me, oh Lord, have mercy on me. And everything somebody does to you, you take it up. And then you speak. One of the ways we will know whether you belong to the kingdom or not is your word. If your word does not reflect Jesus, you don't belong to him. He said, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Just watch what you are saying. Your, your, your mouth is the television of your heart. Your mouth is what reveals the condition of your heart. So if what is coming out of your mouth is not edifying, it's not God glorifying. See, don't argue. The truth is that your heart is also not right with Jesus. There is no two way about it. So you must cry to God and say, Lord, my word must be seasoned with salt. He said that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. That was what we were concluding on yes, uh, the last time. That we must know how to answer every man. It means that you don't answer everybody the same way. That's why you must constantly be in the spirit. To know what God will want you to say. There are times when the Holy Spirit will tell you keep short. If the Holy Spirit cannot tell you keep quiet and you keep quiet. You are not under him. Ordinary keep short. You can't even keep your mouth short. Blah, 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 blah. Then you are not under his control. He can't even, even you, you tell your baby, you do, shh, 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 and that baby keeps quiet. Imagine when you did that, that baby says, leave me, daddy. I must continue to talk. How do you feel with that baby? And yet the Holy Ghost is telling you, keep short, don't say anything, but you can't keep your mouth short. You speak out of anger. You must watch it. You must watch it. It's a sign that your spirit is broken and that you have no control over your spirit. So that was the conclusion the last time that our speech will always be with grace. Our speech will always be with grace. Our speech reveals a lot about us. You just see, just give people time to talk. You will know who they are. Jesus said, the word that I speak to you, their spirit and their life. Your word conveys what you have inside. It reveals your life. So if you are the kind of person that you are always abusive, you can use foul language. It's because foul words are in your heart. Your words are not seasoned with grace. Brethren, we need to watch this. Our words must reflect the kingdom that we represent. Maybe one day we will look more in details on this matter. You remember the Benjamites in the book of Judges. Did you know how they were able to separate the Benjamites from the Israelites when they were to be killed? They asked them to pronounce a word. They call it Shibolet. But the Benjamites cannot pronounce Shibolet. They are like the, the young people in Kwara State, in Nigeria rather. They will say Sibolet. <laughs> Instead of saying Shibolet, they can't pronounce it. They will say Sibolet. So at the tick of the war, why some of the Benjamites were trying to escape and claiming that they were Israelites, they were not Benjamites, they belonged to other tribes, they will ask them to pronounce that word. And they couldn't get it right because it's life. They couldn't fake it. Like, you know, there are people who can't pronounce three. Even me, I struggle to pronounce three very well. But at least I can, if I slow down, I can pronounce it. Some people cannot pronounce three. They say three, three, you know. And there's nothing you do. They can't pronounce it. It's their life. It's their nature. That's the way the word that we speak reveals who we are. So instead of blaming somebody and saying, yeah, is this person who provoked me? Is this person who made me to speak like this? You should rather concentrate on your life and cry to God and say, Lord, have mercy on me until my words begin to comfort with grace. So today we will proceed by looking at verse 7, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 7. That's where we will start today. 
It says, All my still, all my state shall take a course, declare unto you, who is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. Now, I want you to keep in mind that this epistle was written to the church. It means this is a letter that will have been read in the assembly where we have people of different ages. We have people of different levels of growth in Christ Jesus. It's a letter to every believer. Now, he reveals something to us in this verse. That as believers, as workers in the house of God, we must all understand. Every servant of God must have three kinds of personalities. The first one he said about Tychicus is that this man, he said, he is a beloved brother. Now that is describing a minister of God. Every minister of God must first have a brotherly relationship. Sometimes ministers want to relate with you from the position that they are a minister. And you also, you want to relate with them from the position that they are a minister. You boycott the part of being brother. We are all first of all brothers. Equal brothers in Jesus Christ. That's what we all are. Many people have grown to the point now today that they do not see themselves as brothers. I was, I, 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 I went to, somebody invited me to a, a, a very big ministry in Nigeria. And while I was in the office of the sister of the great man of God, as they say, I introduced myself as Brother Sheikh Mumoku Olu. You know, the person who took me there didn't like it. And the person had to correct me that, no, I am Pastor Sheikh Mumoku Olu. But the truth is that I'm not a pastor. <laughs> I'm just a brother. Now, why, why? Do I have to introduce myself as a pastor? Let's even say I'm a pastor. I am first of all to you, a brother. Jesus said, love ye one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Not by preaching. Not by saying I'm a, I'm a big man of God. It is first in the matter of brotherliness. So I do not know where people have this grace for title. This grace for set, setting themselves aside as the big man of God. And he no longer sees himself again as a brother. I can no longer introduce people again and say, we want to thank God for our brother in our midst. He will be speaking to us today. They'll say, no, 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 he's a bishop. He's a bishop. Please address him properly. I can't introduce him and say he's a brother. They say, no, he's a, he's a general overseer. He's a senior apostle. You have to us as brethren. We are first of all brothers. So what, what the scripture is showing us here, it says, who is a beloved brother? You cannot be a great minister of God if you are not first a beloved brother. What you should look in me is, is this, is this brother a true brother? It's not whether I'm a, I'm a great man of God. I'm a man of God. No. Is it that are we brothers first of all? Because that is the core. Do you know that in a family, if today I become the president of Nigeria, you see, my brothers and my sisters, they are not going to relate with me as president of Nigeria. They are going to relate with me as their last born. <laughs> Those people here. Eh? <laughs> I can imagine them calling me, hello, Shagun. If I say, you are talking to a president, you are not serious, what president? Well, please listen to <laughs> They recognize me as their brother, not as president. That does not mean I'm not president. It just simply means I'm a brother. I'm their brother. So he said, beloved brother, we must all be brothers. To be a man of God and not to be a brother. 
is abnormal. When people cannot relate with you as brothers, they can only relate with you as man of God. There is a problem. It is in the world system that people class themselves. People don't want to relate with the people they are leading in the world system in order to create scarcity. And they believe that scarcity creates respect. So you even hear pastors now preaching it, telling you to withdraw from the people so that they can respect you. Why do I need respect? What, what does anybody's respect do to me? The truth is that we are brothers. Why can't we be brothers? If you come to my house, we should relate as brothers. Not as men of God. We should be able to laugh together. We should be able to eat together. They asked a popular, a popular preacher. Because I don't know whether to be calling these people man of God. Maybe just saying servant of God. Or is that man of God? It's not, the man of God is not a title used in the scripture for so many people. Go and check it. Only a few people were referred to in scripture as man of God. Very, very few people. In fact, you can count them on your fingers. Servant of God is more because it takes something to become a man of God. You cannot be preaching money and say you are a man of God. What kind of man of God is that? A man of God is a man that when he shows up, he represents the mind of God. You know that this man, heaven, he is representing heaven. You know that this man is for, is for God. When Samuel shows up, you know this is a man of God. But anyway, so they asked this, this, this servant of God, they asked him. Very big, very popular. As in, when I say pop, I mean, in my country, if you count one to, one to five, he's among them. They asked him, they said, sir, how do you re at a conference where he preached? There was not a time for question and answer. They said, how do you relate at home? Look at that simple question. How do you relate at home? How do you, when you are not preaching, when you are high your life? You know, those people were asking that question because they've always seen him as this, this servant of God, servant of God. They want to know, is he an ordinary man like every other person? I thought this man would say, oh, you know, when I get home, I will remove my clothes, just lie down, ask my wife, how are you? Uh, then get some water. Sometimes I sleep off. You know, sometimes I joke with my kids. I thought he would just explain how normal people live. Guess what he said? He said, well, even when I'm at home, home and i just sit down like this i just i'm i'm not exaggerating no that's the way he said it and i just sit down like this things are happening globally things are happening as i'm sitting down then things are happening i'm like what is this he cannot just come out of being a man of god being a preacher and be normal he can't just come out of that thing he, he feels that the only way they can respect him is if he keep portraying himself as that preacher that is something there's something special about his own life he, there is nothing special we love we are all human we do everything every human being do we are all we we are first of all brothers we must be brothers and sisters first of all people must be able to relate with us the concept of man of God, where you can no longer relate with him as a brother, is a satanic concept. We must, no matter the height God are taking you to. Paul didn't say, my, my son in ministry. As you hear them today, everybody is their son. Nobody is their brother. Can you, when did you hear a preacher saying, my brother, my beloved brother? No, everybody is their son. My, my, you know, one of my son, one of my protege, one of my, one of our student, one of our, one of our, one of our, they are not, we are not brethren again. You can't simply say, do you know, uh, one of my brothers in the Lord? No, 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 brothers, that will place us on equal footing. So you have to uh, elevate it. You know, one of my son, ah, you have elevated your son, you have diminished that person. These things are common, but they are strange to the body of Christ. They are not the way they handed over the church to us. They are not the ways of Christ. Jesus said, love ye one another. He that will be the greatest among you must be he that serves. 
I have shown you example. I am your leader truly, but I'm the one washing your feet. I've given you, I've painted a picture to you of how you are to relate with one another. Peter never related with other people as if he's a special man of God and he's truly special. That's a man that when somebody died, they can just send for him. How many, how many men of God can you send for today if somebody dies? Dockers died and they sent for Peter's. And Peter came and raised the dead. And he went back again to, to stay with a blacksmith where he was living. When they questioned Peter, the Bible said from the beginning, he erased it. When he wrote an epistle, he, he described himself as one of the elders. Can you imagine? Whom I am one of the elders. He didn't say this is Peter, the Pope. <laughs> Some people have labeled him as Pope. He didn't say that. He didn't say this is Peter, the great Peter, the great apostle. And I'm writing to all of you, my sons, all of you, my sons, my small, small boys. You know, they will even say, I sent one of my boys. I sent one of my boys. Who is your boy? What nonsense is that? Who is your boy? <laughs> he said, a beloved brother. The next phase is an a faithful minister. That is the person's relationship with Jesus who gives the ministry. You must first be a beloved brother, a beloved sister, and then a faithful minister as to Jesus. Not people pleaser, but somebody who is faithful to what Jesus asks him to do. A faithful minister. Whatever God has called you to do, do you know you must be faithful? Do you know what Jesus will mark when he comes his faithfulness? That's why I said, good and faithful servants. That would be his commendation. Good and faithful servant. Good refers to your personal character. Faithfulness refers to how you handle this work. Many people treat the things of God with trivialities. They treat it with trivialities. You don't treat it with seriousness. You, you think that God's work is something you do at your leisure. And when you don't have time, you neglect it. When you are, you leave it. But you take every other thing serious. <laughs> That's a great mistake. If there's something you must be faithful at, at doing, it's whatever God has committed to your hand. You don't need anybody to encourage you. You don't need anybody to counsel you. The fact that you know the master is coming to mark your faithfulness, you should be faithful. He described Tychicus as a faithful minister. You see, he is first a brother and then a minister. And a faithful minister at that, not the one that is looking for money. So many of faithfulness. I had a preacher always saying that he's, he never borrowed, he never took loan, he never took overdraft, he never took this, he never took. And each time I hear, I'm like, did we also come to beg you for food? Did people come to beg you for food? All your boasting is about the fact that you never lack money. You cannot boast of the virtue of Christ in your life. You can't say, I never get angry. I never lost after a woman. I am always loving. I'm always patient. I'm always kind. All your boasting is that you, you don't lack money. And the only reason, he, he now said that because he understood the covenant of giving, he now added that some people will say that tithing is, is, is no longer relevant. It's because they have not seen it. Can you imagine? So the only giving that you now understand is tithing. When you read the book of Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said that we separate the sheep from the goat. What was the parameter? He said, when I was hungry, you, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me water. He didn't say, eh, you paid tithes. He said, you help other people. He said, when you did this to my brethren, you did it to me. But today, all they talk about is tithing. As if that tithing is the reason why he never lacked. 
Look at people just deceiving people. You are taking 10% of, 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 of thousands of people's money and then you are boasting that you never lack. That's your only boast. You cannot boast of Jesus. Paul said, I will only boast in my infirmities. Can you imagine a true man of God? He said, I will boast in my infirmities. God said, let him that boast, boast in this, in that he knoweth the Lord. A Christian does not boast with money. If money is your proof of knowing Jesus, you have never met that Jesus. Money. I never borrow. I never did. Even Jesus borrowed. Are you better than Christ? Who has to go and borrow a donkey? Are you better than him? When, when did it become that money is a measure of a man's knowledge of Christ? When did that happen? Unfaithful ministers. Presenting money as a means of measuring people's success with Jesus. When did that happen? If that is the case, then the church in Smyrna, Jesus should just cancel them. Because Jesus said to them, he said, I know your poverty. But that was rich. Money is not a measure of a man's knowledge of Jesus. You can know Jesus and be, and be poor. You may not know Jesus and be rich in this world. But anyone that knows Jesus in the eyes of God is rich. Because there is no riches greater than Christ. You can't have Christ and say you are poor. How can you describe me as poor? Because I simply don't have paper. I have Jesus. The Bible says Christ in me, the hope of glory. He didn't say money in your account, the hope of glory. He says Christ in me, the hope of glory. And these are things they preach to thousands of people, deceiving people daily. And rather than people seeking to know Jesus, they are seeking to have money. There is no compassion in our heart. We are giving money like a businessman, hoping to get return in investment. You don't care about the state of people. You only see a pastor encouraging people to love one another and give to the poor. No, they have to just keep bringing money to the church. They have to just keep giving them, keep giving them, keep giving them. But Jesus said, when I was thirsty, you gave me water. When I was in the hospital, you visited me. He didn't say you pay your tithe. Luke chapter 8, there were women that ministered to the needs of Jesus. They didn't give him 10%. They were not paying tithe to the ministry of Jesus. Out of their compassion for Jesus, they gave to him. Even a woman bought alabaster jar of precious ointment, broke it on Jesus. A year wage. Not tithing. She gave everything she had in a year. Everything. Everything. 100%. And poured it on Jesus. Do you want to preach tithing to such a woman? And that woman, Jesus didn't say, I will make you a billionaire. Do you know the only thing Jesus said is that anywhere the genuine gospel is being preached, the story of what this woman has done will be mentioned. That's why I just mentioned it again this morning. The Jesus come, we will continue to speak of what Mary did. Breaking the alabaster box on Jesus. Pouring a precious oil to preserve his body for burial. A whole year wage. And Jesus didn't say, because you gave this, you'll be, you'll be the richest woman on earth. It never happened. She didn't become a rich woman. This false gospel that if you give so much, you are going to become rich. We are not, we didn't come on earth to be rich. We came here to serve God. We came here to be the pleasure of God, not money. Having food and raiment, we must be contented. Stop boasting that uh, you've never been to a bank, you never borrow, you never have all of this, you never, and so what? Does that mean you know Jesus? Show us the fruit of Christ. Let's see the fruit of the Holy Spirit. These are the same people that anger has filled their heart that they will be saying all kinds of things. They can almost literally fight on pulpits. Fighting people on pulpits. And yet they will go about boasting about the fact that they have money. That shows that's all they have. When did anybody come? When did you see a preacher say, I give God the glory? Since I came to know Jesus, I just noticed that there is a compassion in my heart. 
There is a compassion for the sick. You are boasting that you have millions. In a country where people are dying of malaria. In a country where people are languishing in prison because nobody was there to help them pay 3,000 naira. Less than $3. They are spending years in prison for less than $3 that somebody just needed to pay it on their behalf and they will be gone. And you are boasting. In a country where people had accident and not, almost 98% are dead on the road and there are still people who are alive, in pain, struggling. People didn't help them through life. They were, they were cutting away with the goods in the trailer that had just killed all these people. And the, some of them are still alive. Nobody attended to them. And then we are boasting that we are rich, we are rich, we are rich, we are rich. Of what use is that boasting? In a society where the average person can no longer feed. Where is our love? We are just taking money and giving it to one man. Giving it to one man. And everybody around you is suffering. And you think you are serving God. When last did you give cold water to somebody else? When last did you go to the hospital? Did you know that some people's treatment to be alive is just $10? I've seen a man gone blind for how much? For $2 by today's exchange rate. Gone blind on one eye. The other eye was going blind until a group heard of it and they paid money for his surgery. Today he has only one eye. And we are boasting. We are not even boasting of the fact that we are God is using us to ameliorate people's suffering. Our boasting is that we have money. Can you see the foolishness of man? The Bible talks about a faithful servant, a faithful minister. The next one it says, and a fellow servant in the Lord. Can you see? What should be your relationship? With other ministers of God, he should be fellow servants. So see the three kind of relationship. Number one, a beloved brother. So that's the base. All of us are brothers. We are all brothers and sisters. We are all equal in Jesus. The next one is being faithful, a faithful minister. That is to Jesus, who has called you. The third one is a fellow servant. We are we are all fellow servants. Why can't we refer to ourselves as fellow servants? Why must one be senior pastor? Who is a junior pastor? And who made one a junior pastor? What is the definition of a junior pastor? Why can't we all refer to ourselves as fellow servants? Because that's who we are. We are all fellow servants. Even if you had been in ministry for 50 years, we are all fellow servants. And we are by this not preaching disrespect. We honor every man as a Christian principle. A, a child of God, we don't go about dishonoring anybody. It's not just the fact that you are a minister of God. You won't dishonor anybody. You won't dis dishonor that young girl that is selling granite by the roadside. You won't dishonor her. In fact, if what we are doing is honoring the man of God, but dishonoring everybody, you are playing, you are, you are joking. If you are dishonoring your husband, but you are honoring God, you are playing. You are, dis you are, you are dis dishonoring your parents. You are honoring pastors. You are playing. Respect and honor is a Christian virtue that should be exhibited towards everybody. We must honor all men. All men. It's not just that, oh, because it's a servant of God. You see everybody doing like this. The, the same people that will do like that. Let them just get out of his presence. They are a tiger. They are a terror to other people. Your house help. Your workers, you are a terror to them. But when it comes to the man of God, you are like this. Because that's what they teach. They don't teach you to honor all men. They teach you to honor them. I don't know what, why, I don't know why they are thirsty for honor. 
honor, 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 everywhere. Jesus said, I do not seek my own honor. That's my master. He said, he didn't seek his own honor. Who is me to be seeking honor from men? If Jesus did not seek honor from men, who am I? It is God that honors. So, fellow servant in the Lord. We are fellow servants. We are co-laborers. I've seen ministry. That's how they refer to themselves. Co-laborers. Because they will not use all these ungodly nomenclatures to create class. There is no class in the body of Christ. There is no division in the body of Christ. The same blood, the same spirit, the same mercy, the same cross. So why do you think your own salvation is better than mine? Why do you think you are, you are of a class? There is no class system in the body of Christ. We are one in the body of Christ. There is no superiority. Of course, we have administrations, we have elders, but there is no superiority. He said, whom I, verse 8, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that you might know your estate and comfort your heart. Then look at the next brother I was going to talk about. The first one is Tychicus. Then Onesimus. He said, look at it, a faithful and beloved brother. <laughs> a faithful and beloved brother. A faithful and beloved brother. Who is one of you? They shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Now, what is the difference between Tychicus and Onesimus? Tychicus was not a servant of God in the context of ministry. We are all servants of God as children of God. But so that baseline he is there. He is a brother. Fellow brother or faithful brother or beloved brother. He's a brother. We are brothers. So the same way Tychicus is first a beloved brother. Onesimus is also a faithful and beloved brother. That baseline is there. And you will see that uh, Paul did not give an impression that he was a one-man battalion, one marshal. There's no one marshal anywhere. <laughs> there is no one man. Just like there is nobody that is self-made. Only a fool is self-made. Nobody is self-made. No, nobody or not. Every one of us, somebody helped us. How can you be self-made? The day you were born, can you walk? Can you talk? Can you prepare your own food? Was it not somebody who did all that for you? Can you clean yourself? Only a fool says he is self-made. Nobody, no human being is self-made. Now, he, he went to the next brother, Aristarchus. Aristarchus. He said, my fellow prisoner. See the way he was describing people, fellow. My fellow prisoner. Because that means that that brother was with him in prison. Or probably in another prison. A fellow prisoner, Aristarchus. My fellow prisoner saluted you. And Marcus, see his recognition of other people. Not painting an impression that this thing is all about him. Without this action, we would never have known that all these brothers, God had raised so many brothers to support that ministry. We would think that it was just Paul, 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 Paul. How many things could Paul have done? He had an army of brothers and sisters behind him. And thank God he gave them recognition in the epistles. And that's why forever they will all be in the canon of the scriptures. He said, Marcus, sister son to Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandment, if he come unto you, receive him. So you can see that having dealt with mysteries, scriptures, he's now dealing with domestic affairs. <laughs> he's telling them, greet this person for me. This person sent his greetings. So he's not just somebody that 
Brother Paul is not somebody that is always in the spirit. Always in the spirit. You will go and sit in a shrine. <laughs> he is a normal human being like you that has relationships. We all have relationships. We all play, we all joke, we all, we are all with each other. And just, and Jesus, which is called Justus, who are of the circumcision, these only are my, look at, look at what he say again. So you will know that it's not a mistake. These only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. He didn't say, these are my boys. These are my sons. My son here. My son there. My boy there. My boy there. He said, these are my fellow, fellow, fellow workers. Do you know that's what we are? Do you know that in the kingdom we are fellow workers? My work is not more important than your own. What is required is for every one of us to be faithful at our posts. We are all doing this in a company. You have a gate man. You have a general manager. They are both serving the company. That gate man, he can, he can cause that company to collapse. And everybody in that company will be with that job. And in fact, he can cause everybody in that company to be killed. They are all workers. <laughs> we, we call on, you know that even in the labor unions, they call themselves workers. It is when they get to office that they are saying, this is director, this is assistant director, this is deputy director, principal officer, um, admin officer, all of those. When you get to office, you do that. But when we get to workers union, everybody become workers. <laughs> Anybody can contest and become president. It no longer matter your position in the office anymore. We are all workers. So we are fellow workers unto the kingdom of God. Now, look at verse 12 again. Another brother, Epaphras. Epaphras, who is one of you? A servant of Christ. A servant of Christ saluted you. Always. See, let's spend some time here. What is the first thing he said about this brother? He said, a servant of Christ. When did you see a minister introduce a younger minister and say, Look at this servant of Christ. No, they will introduce this as one of my boys. One of my boy. He said, see, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ. He's introducing him as a servant of Christ. Some people will not do that. They say, if I do that now, people will start going to him. <laughs> you know, it's a terrible thing when you are not secured in Christ. Our security is in Christ. It does not matter who comes to you or who leaves. You must not possess people. People must be free to come to you and they must be free to go away. People left Jesus so much that he remained only 12. He didn't beg them and say, our brethren, this work is much now. You want to leave only me? He said, won't you also go? Peter said, where are we going? We are not miracle seekers. We are seeking the word of eternal life. Miracle seekers are the ones that goes away. We, we are seeking the word of God and we are finding it on your, on, your, on your lips. Where then are we going? Where will we find it again? There's no, there's no problem for people to leave you. You can't possess people. You are not a creator. God is the one who created all men. People can come. People can go. Let them go. It should not cause any quarrel. It should not cause any fight. You don't own them. They belong to God. I don't own any one of you listening to me. You can decide you are you don't want to listen again. You have and it will not cause any form of um annoyance or hurt. No, 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 no. Wherever you are, I will still wish you well. I've seen churches, they say, if you leave us, if you leave us, you will never succeed. That's a cult. It is a cult that fights people not to leave. You can't join a cult and decide that you want to leave. The court will fight you. They will not, they will ensure you don't succeed in what you are doing. So when you hear a supposed church say, if you leave us, you can never succeed. They are a court. They are not a church. They should pray for you and send you wherever you are going in the name of the Lord. They don't control you. He says, he salutes you 
Now, look at something, brother. It says, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. I want to show you who is a servant of Christ. This is the verse where we pick the theme for today. He said, laboring fervently for you in prayers. That's a servant of Christ. Did they pay him a dime? No. They didn't even know that he was laboring for them in the place of prayer. He was with Paul. He was not with them. But he was laboring for them. A servant of God is not being paid to pray. A servant of Jesus labors in the place of prayer over the life of men. See, it is, it is the duty, the calling of a servant of God is to preach the word of God. It is not to come and be praying, using prayer to solve your problem. That's not his calling. It is his responsibility to pray and intercede in his closet. Some people have this oracle, uh, what have you described it? This herbalist mentality. Somebody called me yesterday and said, Sir, my husband is traveling out of the country without telling me. Please, I want you to pray to cancel that journey. And I do you think you are consulting an Anifa oracle? Do you think you have come to a shrine to come and meet a one elderly man to do some concussion to destroy things? How can you tell me that your, your husband you that you are not serving Jesus. You, you, you now want that Jesus to rise up on your behalf and say, I cancel that man's trip. I cancel it. I didn't respond. I ignored it. Because if I should, if I should talk to her, that what is wrong with you? What do you take God for? Your boy? The God that you do not obey, that you don't serve? You want him to, to come and cancel your husband, your husband's trip abroad. He should, he should come and cancel it for you. <laughs> so that's, that's the idea people have of a man of God. Somebody they can just go and meet and say, see, see this problem. Now I want you to just use your prayer and destroy this problem. That's not a man of God. <laughs> Our primary responsibility is to preach the word of God. Did you see where Paul said bring your prayer point? Did you ever see where any of the apostles asked people to bring prayer point? Did you see it? It is a normal thing. It is expected that a servant of God must pray over men. Laboring. And they don't need to know. They don't need to know. That is why Anywhere you see anybody setting up prayer meeting, where they are scrolling account number and taking money, it is falsehood. It is not a prayer meeting. You are wasting your time going there. Nothing will come out of it. Go and attend it. Caught me anywhere. Go and attend it for 50 years. Nothing will come out of it. It is fraud. And people are setting it up now. And they are using it to deceive people. Did you know that today is Sunday, just yesterday, a woman called me. She said somebody called her and said that um, he's, he's calling on behalf of uh, Shegumukulu, that is me, that I have created a prayer group on WhatsApp and uh, I'm inviting people to come and join. And that uh, he's going to send a code to her and she will send the code and she will be added to the group. Now, what they want to do was to hack our WhatsApp. But they are using my name to say they are starting up a prayer group. Why? Because they know that people, people now have an idolatry perspective to prayer. Ah, prayer. Ah, Russia is organizing prayer. Hey, we must go there. We must go there. So they know people will be deceived. So when she spoke to me, I said, well, I don't organize any prayer, man. This is me. You are now speaking to me. I have no prayer anywhere. I don't, do not call people secretly behind and say, I'm doing something. I'm doing something. I'm doing something. If you fall for it, you will just fall for it too. Because we do not understand prayer. 
How can you say you are doing prayer meeting and you are scrolling account number? For what? For what? When did prayer suddenly become about money? And because people see that somebody is making money from it, everybody is starting it now. What people do is what brings money. It's not what brings souls. People don't care about souls. And you will see, they will never speak against sin. They will just keep telling you that you will make it. You know people love for so. Some, they, people enjoy somebody coming to lie to them. Tell you that all your problem is your, your, your problem is your mouth. Your problem is your anger. Your problem is your sinful lifestyle. Your problem is that you do not obey Jesus. But they are telling you that this one is soft. You are getting visa. There are unbelievers getting visa. They don't even pray. Do you know how many people are traveling to a different part of the world? They don't pray. They don't pray. They just get visa. And then account number will be scrolling. All kinds of cash app is there. Seller is there. Anything. And even PayPal is made available. Just by any means, put money. Pounds account, dollars account, euros account. In the name of prayer, it is a lie from the pit of hell. There is no prayer going on. It's cheap manipulations and deception to take people's money. Period. Nothing more. The name of what kind of useless prayer is that that you are praying? You just be telling them their prayer will be answered. You will just see God. God will just be doing it. The God that we are all disobeying. Who do you take God to be? The God that every simple instruction we don't obey Him. He said, God will do it. He will make it. You will just be shiny. You will just be shiny. We are. Where are you going? The way of the transgressor is hard. There is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. Teach people to repent from their sins. And you will see their lives straighten up. But other than do that, you are deceiving them. That's your marriage. That every problem in your marriage is just going to disappear. It is a lie. They laid wrong foundation for that marriage. They are not applying the word of God in that marriage. They are telling them, it will just go. The problem will just go. It doesn't go like that. If it can go like that, Jesus will come and do prayer to solve our problem. But he sat down and taught us. Many women do not know how to marry. Many women are controlled by their emotions. Until you, are, you teach them the word of God to deal with that, there is no amount of prayer that will resolve the problem they have in marriage. You are just deceiving people. And then you will scroll account number. For what? For prayer meeting. Peter was going to prayer meeting. Somebody saw him. He said, can I have some money? Peter said, I don't even, I don't even have a cent on me. But what I have, I give unto you. But today, account number are scrolling. Millions are rolling in. Millions. Billions. I even had some people are making billions now. Billions are rolling in. People love deception. Let me tell you. Because you've refused truth, you've refused Jesus, they will dupe you. They will dupe you. They will take all your money. I've seen people that they've rendered them penniless. Because you refuse the truth, they will dupe you. First stars, first prophet, they will dupe you. They will take all your money. Continue. They will take everything from you. God is offering you something for free. You prefer to go and pay for lies. Truth is available for free, but you prefer to pay for lies. Oh God, no problem. <laughs> pay. The preacher himself will face his own judgment. You yourself, you will face your own judgment. Except you repent. Because you are promoting evil. Your money is what is being used to sponsor falsehood. That means you are part of the enemy of Jesus. Look at a genuine servant of Christ. Always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Always. It's a labor. They don't know. If Paul didn't mention it to them, they would not have known. That's a true man of God. Let's look at his prayer point. Whether it's to get visa. That you may stand perfect 
and complete in all the will of God. Look at the prayer point. That you may stand and complete in all the will of God. In all the will of God. When did you attend a prayer meeting when they are praying for you to be perfect? When last? That the essence of the prayer meeting you are attending is for you to be perfect. When did you attend such a prayer meeting? No, it's that witches will die. It's the end fault. You will begin to swim in money. You will begin to swim in money. That is witchcraft. Let me tell you. That is, you are seeing Satan at work full time in our day, but you don't know. You think Satan is going to come with horn and do like this. I'm here, I'm here. No, 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 no. Satan is wearing a nice suit. He's speaking Polish English. Hey, God is going to be lifting you. You're going to be lifted, lifted. Where are you flying to? Where are you a balloon? Where are you going? Where are you going? And you, ju you just keep enjoying that deception. You've been doing this thing for years. Nothing has happened, but you keep enjoying it. You love deception so much, you can't think. You can't ask yourself a question. Are, are those the issues of prayers? A man that has been, that, that he says he's a servant of God, that never speaks against sin. Can't you get it that he's a servant of Satan? The Bible said God sent Jesus to deliver us from our sin. Sin is the problem of man. You don't know. Sin, disobedience is our problem. Anybody who really wants to help you, we help you to be obedient to God. Otherwise, it's just pure deception. Why are you scrolling account number? Account number for what? On top of prayer, even preaching of the word of God, we are not scrolling account number. Why should we be scrolling account number? For prayer. For what? Who are you paying? Why are you paying? What is the money for? And you can still get it that that is covetousness. That is deception. That is Satan at his best. They waste your life. They waste your time. They give you false hope and they take everything you have on you. He said, this, he said the enemy has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy it. Satan will always steal from you. And if he means using Bible, he will use Bible to steal from you. This is a genuine servant of God. Praying for the church to be perfect. Praying for the church to be complete in the will of God. Look at prayer. This is, this is prayer. Laboring. And they didn't know. And I say to you, every genuine servant of God prays. And they pray, they labor over people they are ministering to. The people don't need to know. And it's not about money. And I'm not saying we don't pray with, we cannot pray with one another. I'm not saying you can't say, is this issue troubling me? Can we pray? Now, you see, what we will do first is to examine scriptures. Because sometimes you may think the issue is prayer. It may not be prayer. I've seen people come to me and say that I should pray for them. And when we examine the issue, it didn't require prayer. It just required the word of God. Eventually, God will give us a word from the scripture and say, we say, brother, this is what God is saying. This thing doesn't require prayer. Go and do what he says. God says, go and love your wife. As Christ loved the church. And then you are praying and said, see, my, my, my wife is a thorn in my flesh. This, let's, let's pray, let's pray. No, my brother, first of all, go and love your wife as Christ loved the church. You are disobedient. You are rude to your husband. There's nothing you cannot say to him. And then you are going about praying, praying, looking for prayer. No, go and obey the words of Jesus and see whether that marriage will not have peace. You think it's his prayer? If it is prayer, do you think Jesus will sit his disciples down and be teaching them? Why did Jesus spend time teaching us? Why did he ask us to also go and teach? If it is prayer, they met Jesus physically. He could just say, I solve all your problem today in the name, in my name. Boom. Problem is solved. He didn't do that. He taught them how to be poor in spirit. He taught them how to be meek. He taught them how to be peaceful. He taught them how to endure persecution. He taught them how to be light. 
He taught them how to be salt. He taught them not to go into adultery. You are going into adultery. You say your marriage is having trouble. And you are, you are going to meet people to pray for you. And they are telling you every marital problem is resolved. It's a lie. You better go and repent of your adultery. The Bible says every adulterer God will judge. Hebrews chapter 13. I think verse 4. He said every adulterer God will judge. Instead of you to repent of your adultery. You are, you are looking for somebody to pray for your marriage to have peace. It cannot have peace. He says, for I bear him record. <laughs> you know what? And when Paul says he bears somebody's record, you can be sure it's a serious matter. He said, I bear him record that he had great zeal for you. And then that are in Laodicea. And then that are in Hierapolis. Can you imagine? This brother was interceding for churches all over. That's a true servant of Christ. Without being paid anything. In fact, the people he was praying for did not know he was praying for them. You don't need to go and pray a man of God. You know there are men of God now. It is money that determines how they pray for you. But the truth is that that prayer, even if they pray with all of their heart, it will fly nowhere because it's a covetous prayer. They are praying because of money. So if you grease their hand with millions, then they will go to their father. Father! This is my son! But if you are the type that you just give regular offering, Lord, all this one, just look on them also. <laughs> So he thinks because he has gone to father, he has seen millions, and he has gone to the father. father. So you think God, you think God will respond to you, to your useless noise, because now you can't, you are shouting God, because somebody had given you millions. And this other brother, that all he has is one dollar and he has dropped it. Uh, father, see... <laughs> You are wasting your time. You will face the wrath of God. You think, you think prayer is about how much effort you put into it. Is that prayer? Prayer that you are collecting money to pray does not get to God. It only goes to your bank account. Prayer that you collect money to pray does not go to heaven. It goes to your bank account. And it's wasted there. It's not going to do anything. It is just lips. It, it's not, you, you think God is like you. That you collect money and come and cry to him. God, God, this is my son. Ah, you must not die because, because of money. That's the voice of covetousness. That's not the voice of faithfulness. Anyway, let's round up this scripture this day. <laughs> it says, Look, the beloved physician and Demas greet you. So there's a recognition for people that work with him. Okay? There's a recognition. For people that work with him. Did you notice that sometimes when we start the program, I call people's name and I greet them. You know why we do it? It's because of scriptures like this. It's not just frivolities. It's not just because I just like your faces. <laughs> Even though I like your faces. It's, it's a recognition of people. Okay? It's, it's a recognition of people. There is no one man battalion. No, nobody. Nobody. I was discussing with one of our sisters, thank God she's here, that there's a book that we are planning to, to print. That it was somebody, do you believe that? Somebody called me and said, when are you printing your next book? I said, well, apart from reprinting, we want to add another book that we have not printed. But that will be end of October stroke early November. And the person said, all right, let me know. And the person says, see, I have set aside money. And somehow I even forgot, I seem to have forgotten about it. So it was the person who later called me and said, what about the book something? I said, oh, sorry, 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 that I'm already even done with the manuscript just to do a few things. The person said, all right. And I said, this person on Friday sent money for us to print that book. I didn't go to the person to say, hey, hey, the Lord says you must sow it. No. It was this person who called me and said, when are you printing book? 
When are you printing book? Now, by the time we are done and the book is out, my name will be on that book. But do you think I'm the one alone? Some people prayed. That book, there are people that it was in the course of my interaction with them that some scripture opened forth unto me to understand. Their stories became a help to that book. There is no one man anywhere. Everybody have their role. And you may never get to know this person I'm talking about. You may never see her. But you see, heaven knows her. But it is important not to give an impression that it is you alone doing it. There's nobody like that. <laughs> Even Jesus, when he started, what did he do? He called 12 people to himself. He was not alone. He called 12 people. So he said, look, the beloved physician. Hallelujah. How many of you are doctors, nurses, health workers, all of you here? God bless you all. You see, I don't know whether Luke used to attend to Paul. <laughs> but Paul expressed the greetings of a health physician that was there. It means that you can be a health physician around Paul. You can be a medical doctor and be serving Jesus. You can be a nurse and be serving Jesus. You can be health workers and be serving Jesus. You can be a nanny and be serving Jesus. You can be a housewife and be serving Jesus. You can be a businesswoman and be serving Jesus. You can be anything and be serving Jesus. He didn't say a servant of God. See, he's been saying fellow servant, faithful servant, servant of Christ. But when he came to look, he said the beloved physician. So don't think when we say serve God, we are necessarily telling you, hey, go and drop what you are doing. Go and carry Bible and go to the streets. Serve him in what you are doing. You can be a beloved, what now? A beloved nurse. Uh -huh. That one comes to my head because my sister is a nurse. And my mom too. <laughs> you can be a beloved nurse. You can be a beloved teacher. You can be a beloved accountant. You can be a beloved civil servant. You can be, what do we have again? Many, there are many of them. Just, just put yourself, what you are doing, just put it there. A beloved, then put what you are doing there. You can be all of that in Jesus. Thank God for a passage like this. You can see some people are described as servant of Christ, as fellow servant. And some people are also described as physicians. We are all not going to be preachers, brethren. <laughs> we are not going to be preachers. All right? He says, and Demas greet you. That one, we don't know what he was doing. <laughs> I'm hoping this is, not the, this is the Demas that forsook him at a point and then came back. You see, you will have Demas, brethren. You will have Demas. They, they are also useful. <laughs> Demas are also useful. Occasionally, they may go, they may, but they will come back. Eh? That will be Demas. So it's not everybody that will be servant of Christ or physician. There will be demons that we don't know what they are doing, but God will just, you know, the grace of God will cover all of us. So there will be some demons amongst us. Whether you like it or not, we will have demons. He says, salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, Nymphas, and the church which is in his house. You see, a church can be in a house. Hallelujah. A church can be in somebody's house. But he says, salute, salute. So, brethren, do you know that it is scriptural injunction for us to greet? <laughs> you don't just greet because you feel like. Scripture tells you to greet. Eh? So, greet people. Today, put it to practice. Greet people. Some people, somebody you've not called in a while, call the person, a, bre a brother in Christ, call the person and greet the person. Greet somebody. Greet somebody today and say, I greet you as my brother or my sister in Jesus. I greet you today. He says, salute, salute, salute brethren. Salute the brethren. That's an instruction. Salute the brethren. Which are in Laodicea, Nymphas, and the church which is in his house. Now verse 16 says, and when this epistle is read among you. Hallelujah. Look at the instruction to the church. Cause it that it be read also in the church of Laodiceans. And that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So there are other epistles. We must read them. You see, we are finishing Colossians now. What this is telling us is that we must continue with the epistles. <laughs> and then, but he says, you must cause it to be read also in the church of Laodiceans. That means whether you will transport it, you will post it by courier, make available the means to make sure this gospel get to the Laodicea. It's a responsibility. 
It's a responsibility that you must ensure that the gospel of Jesus gets to everywhere it should get to. He said, cause it. So be part of the people who will cause this gospel to get to the Laodiceans. And when I'm speaking like this, I'm not speaking of what me I'm preaching. I'm speaking of gospel, the God, the true gospel of Jesus, not just this, but the gospel of Jesus. It doesn't have to be what we are doing. Cause the gospel of Jesus to be had everywhere. It could be getting Bibles. There are Gideons Internationals. You can pay for Bibles that they can distribute more Bibles in hotels. That's part of what you can do for Gideons International. You can pay for Bibles. There are many things. Whatever God has laid on you, just ensure that you cause the gospel to be had in Laodicea, not just limited to you. Whatever, it could also be sharing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just pressing share, share. Not the share that somebody is saying, share, share, that you'll be blessed. So you see people who will never greet you, who will never say hello to you, who will never check on you. But because somebody is deceiving them that if they share this post, they are going to be blessed, then they'll start sharing prayer link to you. Now, that's not what we are saying. Do this with a mind for Christ. Share with a desire that people will know God. You, you watch a message on YouTube, it blessed you greatly. Put it on your WhatsApp status. You came across a video on, on Facebook. Just press share. Is, is it more than that? Just press share. And I'm not talking about what, simply what we are doing. I'm saying generally. Gen it could be just scriptures. You just posting scriptures. There's a sister that always posts scriptures. Every day. It could just be that. Somebody will hear the word of God just by doing that. Right? Then he says, and say to Archippus, say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. It is your responsibility to fulfill your ministry. Even Jesus, can you imagine? You would think Jesus is the one who will fulfill it. He said, Jesus is saying to you, the ministry you have received, take heed, be serious about it, give attention to fulfill it, otherwise you won't fulfill it. It takes dedication to fulfill a ministry. He said, take heed, take heed to the ministry. See, there are other things, but the one that you receive specifically from the Lord, that he says, this is what I want you to do. Now he says, say to Archippus, this may not be everybody, but there are maybe Archippus listening to me. Take heed that you fulfill your ministry. Stop playing with sin. You can't fulfill ministry by living in sin. Give attention and dedication to it. Don't play with it. The salutation of the hand of me, Paul. Look at the last thing he said. Remember my bonds. Can you see how this brother has encouraged the church so much? Yet he was in chains. Yet he was not looking for pity. He wasn't saying, brethren, look at me in chains. Won't you send me money? Won't you send some seed? That was the last thing he mentioned. He said, remember my bonds. What does that mean? Pray for me. Pray for me. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. He did not make his personal problem his message. Today, when some people are having lack in their home, that's when they come to the pulpit. Give! 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 It's because he wants to pay school fees. <laughs> That was the last thing he mentioned. Remember my bonds. He wrote all of these truths in pain. He wrote all of these truths in great discomfort. Some of us think discomfort is a sign that we should not serve God. Ah, no. Even in pain, even in discomfort, we will serve God. Be encouraged. In pain, we must serve him. In discomfort, we will still serve him. Remember people in bonds. Remember people, pray for people that are, that are Christians who have been kidnapped in different parts of the world. When you are praying, always remember 
there are believers who are locked up in prison for civil offense that they may not even know anything about. Remember brethren who are on the hospital bed. Remember your brothers and sisters who are in pain. It says, remember my bonds. We'll stop here today and just speak to God. Let's pray. We started by looking at the issue of our tongue, what we say, and that we cannot speak out of anger. If you have a problem with your tongue, there is a call in heaven that God used to purge Isaiah. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. So they took a coal of fire in heaven and his tongue was burnt and it was purified. Ask God to touch your tongue with that coal today. It will happen. If you sincerely mean this and you cry to God and say, God, my tongue is my problem. I have realized I'm of unclean lips like Isaiah. I'm telling you, Heaven will respond today by touching that tongue with the coal of fire. God will purify that tongue. We went further to see the fact that we are first of all brothers and sisters. Ask God to give you simplicity of heart and to give us in the church simplicity of heart. We have seen a servant of God being faithful in prayer. Ask God that you will be faithful in whatever he has committed to your hand. The ministry he has given to you, ask that you will be faithful. Time is going that you will fulfill it. Let's pray that this gospel of Jesus will be heard everywhere. He said, cause that it be read in Laodicea. Part of that is also praying that God cause this gospel to be heard everywhere. In every circle, let the truth of Jesus be heard everywhere. Deliver your church from deception, from lies and deceit, from false teaching and heresies. Let the truth of the word of Christ prevail in the body of, in the body of Christ. Let's remember those who are sick. Some of us may are, are even sick. We have pains in our body. On account of the word today that says we must remember those who are in bonds. Let's remember that and say, Father, our brothers and sisters who are on bed, who are sick, who cannot move, who are waiting for you to heal so that their body can be used to serve you. May you look down the day with the eye of mercy. May the healing virtue of Christ touch every bone, every nerve, every cell. We speak the word of God to every cell in their bodies that they will begin henceforth to reproduce and walk the way God designed them to walk. Every abnormally we cease. Every bone that is shaking, every bone that has slipped will, will be restored. If God can restore dry bones, how much more living bones? Every diseases in any organs, we purge them out in the name of Jesus. We remember our brothers, some who have been kidnapped in Gaza, some who have been held in prison in different places, even some who are being held in prison in Israel. Let's ask that God in his mercy, in different parts of the world, he will show mercy as he set Peter free from the clutches of Herod. Our brothers and sisters also will experience great deliverance. Thank him for the way he has spoken to our lives. Give him all the glory. Give him all the praise. Really, really thank him for he has been merciful and gracious unto us. Let's round up our prayers by committing our week into his hands. 
that he will order our steps aright and he will direct our path. He will keep us from all evil. According to his word, that he will keep our going out and our coming in. That this week, the Lord will keep us. Evil will be far away from you. He will grant unto you daily bread. Your life will come for him in eternity. Thank him and praise his holy name. As we round up our prayers, in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen.